For all the condos and subdivisions currently under construction in this province, the provincial government says it wants, and we still need, more housing. So, in addition to what developers are doing, legislation passed last year facilitates homeowners adding a laneway or garden house to their property. With us now on whether such units can play a meaningful part in relieving the housing crunch, we are joined in Sudbury, Ontario by architect Angèle Dimitruk. She's a partner at Third Line Studio. And here in our studio, in the big smoke, Greg Lintern, chief planner at the City of Toronto, Tim Park, director of planning services for the City of Kingston, and architect Christine Lawley. She is the founder and principal at Solaris Architecture. And it's great to have you three here in our studio. Angel, thanks for being there from the Nickel City for us. And I'll start with you, because we're going to be talking today about so-called laneway houses, coach houses, garden suites, accessory buildings, call them whatever you want. To what extent, in your view, are they a part of the housing crunch solution that we need in Ontario right now? I think they definitely play a huge role in just the densification of neighborhoods in filling those uh, in-between spaces. Here in Sudbury, uh, what you'll see more of is secondary dwelling units, and we've allowed this. The city had uh, passed bylaws in 2018 and 2020, allowing for secondary dwelling units, up to two secondary dwelling units on a lot, so a total of three residential units on one property. And you see, so uh, this is becoming kind of more popular uh, throughout the city. You'll see a lot of individuals that have detached garages on their properties. Obviously in Sudbury, uh, we have much larger properties and, and, and lots than down south. So we have that ability to may not have the exact same infrastructure as say a laneway house where you have that additional kind of street to be able to approach but with the larger size lots we can achieve that sort of driveway kind of throughout the deep lot there you know if you have something that's roughly 200 feet well now you've got that accessory dwelling unit that's at the back of the lot that can provide drive uh driveway to it and parking so i think it, it, it's definitely uh, a big need as it helps with, as I mentioned, densification and just uh, really creating that um, different housing types within your neighborhood uh, urban fabric. Good. Okay, Tim, your view on whether this is a big, medium, small, irrelevant part of the solution? What would you say? Um, I would say in the Kingston context, it's, it's certainly a, a part of the solution. I don't think it's the silver bullet to save the, the housing crunch. Um, what it does is gives opportunity for gentle intensification within existing residential neighborhoods. I hear that expression a lot, gentle intensification. Yes. What does that mean? Well, it, it means adding features or, or, or you know homes and uh, buildings that are of like nature. So you're not gonna get something that's gonna come in and be a mid rise or a high rise in the middle of a neighborhood. You're gonna get second unit or a backyard unit, which is much more in keeping with the existing neighborhood context and fabric and is a little less uh, invasive to the existing residents. So I do think they, they play an important role. Uh, I think it's best to have a variety of housing types in order to address the housing crisis. And this is certainly one uh, aspect that will help move towards that. Part of the mix. Part of the mix, Got exactly. It. Christine, your view on this? Well, my view is that we do have a housing crisis, but we also have an ownership crisis. And people want to own homes. It's a very North American ideal. It's part of our economy, is to own a home. So accessory dwelling units do add more units, but as of now, the way that the programs are structured is that those units still belong to the main parcel of the, the main house. You can't own them, can you? You, you could be the property owner, but you don't own the laneway house or the accessory mm -hmm. dwelling unit independently. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of the program that could very easily evolve. But right now, it is adding that gentle, uh, gentle intensification that, that Tim mentioned. It's adding units where there's already great infrastructure in terms of schools and parks and shopping and neighborhoods. But ultimately, it doesn't add more ownership opportunities, which is 
something that, that can be fixed. Um, it's not a, a kind of infrastructural issue. It's it's really about legislation. So, uh, Greg, where are you on this? Well, we've all seen the cranes. Certainly in Toronto, you see the cranes. Um, and you may have seen the odd really large house, sometimes pejoratively called a monster house, um, but not a lot in the middle between mm -hmm. those two extremes. And I think we've, we've heard a lot in the last in the last couple of years about the missing middle so that's where the, the laneway suites the garden suites uh, multiplexes other forms of low-rise housing they kind of fall in that middle um, and there is a need for not only for more supply of housing but there's a need for ground related housing not everybody uh, wants to live in a tall building and and not a lot of people can necessarily afford uh, to get into uh, places of choice and uh, across the city's neighborhoods. A lot of our neighborhoods, uh, vast majority of our residentially zoned neighborhoods, only permit single, a single unit in a house mm -hmm. until recently. Mm -hmm. So that's what this is about. It's mm -hmm. about expanding housing options, housing choice for more people, uh, for, for more people of more of variety of need and means. And uh, is it gonna solve the crunch? Nope, it's not gonna <laughs> solve the crunch, um, but, um, you, it's a complex problem. Is it a part of the puzzle? It's, it's part of the puzzle. It's a complex problem. You don't approach a complex problem with a single tool. You, you approach it with a variety of tools. And, and it's important to have this in our toolkit, I think, right across the province. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Okay, let's put the accent on Kingston here for a second. And Sheldon, I'll ask you to bring this graphic up because here's what's been going on in the Limestone City over the last many years. In 2019, we got secondary residential units in Kingston. In a detached building, they are, as of 2019, permitted a building akin to a separate laneway house. And in 2022, a third residential unit is permitted, that's up from two, in an existing building. Now let's flip that over and see what impact that has had. In 2018, they let 12 permits granted for secondary units. In 2019, 56 permits. This is now including detached buildings, so big jump there from 12 in the previous year. In 2020, 117 permits. But 2021, 98. 2022, 80. Okay, Tim, I don't know a lot about math, but those numbers look like they're going in the wrong direction. What's happening? Um... I would say that 2021 permits and the 2022 are reflective of the pandemic uh, because those are things that are coming out of the pandemic. Uh, the uptake on second residential units in the city has been growing. I think it represents about 10% of our total residential building permits at this time. So we have seen a fairly steady um, pickup on those types of residential units within our permit system. Okay, let's put the accent now on Toronto. And again, Sheldon, I'll ask you to bring up the numbers for Toronto because it was in 2018 that the capital city of Ontario first permitted laneway houses. 2019, the project was expanded citywide. And here has been the impact. 667 building permit applications for laneway homes, those permits were issued. 516 permits issued. 147 projects completed. 199 projects under construction. Okay, Greg, chew on those numbers and tell us what you infer from all of that. Well, it brand new in 2018 and expanded in 2019. So I think the city is kind of building, it's in that capacity building moment where more architects, more designers, more uh, industry contractors, and especially property owners are becoming more aware of this opportunity. And you can go there now in our laneways and see um, uh, people living and, and living out their daily life in, in laneways. I remember taking a bike ride in our lanes in 2017 and uh, great spaces, but nobody living there. And you can do that same bike ride today. And, uh, and it's a fabulous, I think, evolution underway. Is it gonna happen overnight? No, it's not, because I think it has to scale up. But the, you know, this is about providing and enabling the opportunity, which didn't previously exist. No, I get you. And I think that's important. When you, when you consider that this city's got almost 3 million people living in it, and these numbers are, shall we say, modest, it looks like there hasn't been much uptake. Is that fair to say? It's, it's fair to say, except that it didn't. It's, it's something that had a cold start in 20, 20, uh, 2018, 2019. And then, as, as was noted in Kingston, pandemic 
tends to make people pause. Uh, a lot of problems with supply chain, with labor, with contractors. Um, I think people will be getting into the opportunity more, and we've just introduced the permission in July 22 for garden suites. Mm -hmm. So that is something that's just coming on less than a year and already getting some interest in that and some projects under construction. Again, I just emphasize that this is a brand new thing. We wrote a report in 2007 and said, don't do this in Toronto. Mm. So it is something new to the consciousness. A bit of, of a culture of, shift of, necessary. It's a big culture shift. Yeah. Okay. Christine, are these places, do they tend to be affordable for the people who want them? Oh, I mean, it depends how you look at it. I mean, first of all, I have to say it's an amazing program and it is evolving steadily. You know, in November, they loosened laws, the bylaws, to promote uh, more easily the development of these laneway homes. So that's something that Toronto's, you know, Toronto's moving. It's, it's just a slow uptake. But I think that generally the main reason, we get tons of leads for building laneway houses. The main reason people don't want to do them is the cost. They sort of think, oh, well, a garage is, you know, 100000 and so if I double it, it's 200000 But a laneway house is going to cost half a million dollars at a minimum hmm. to build. Now, I'd challenge you to find a condo to buy in Toronto for half a million dollars, and you won't be able to do it. Harder to do nowadays. Yeah. Now, this comes with the land, obviously, but um, as, a, as a, an alternate to buying a condo for somebody who wants to add value to their property, the, the laneway house is, is a treasure. It's a million dollar treasure sitting in your backyard waiting <laughs> for you to dig it up. But is it reasonable, Greg, to expect to be able to purchase, to, to construct and then purchase a home, admittedly a smaller home, a garden suite or a laneway home, for $200,000 in this city, given what real estate prices are? You know, I, I think what was pointed out is that the land value is taken out of this equation. So. You, that reduces the cost of housing overall mm -hmm. quite significantly and puts it in a more competitive situation um, when you're dealing with uh, with uh, condo development in the city. Um, you know, I, I come back to focusing on, on people with this question and how this might offer an opportunity for someone to help uh, them pay the mortgage. It might offer an opportunity for someone who has uh, intergenerate intergenerational living needs. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the grandparents out back, maybe the parents out back, mm. maybe the kids in the house and vice versa. Um, uh, many of us, I'm sure many of your listeners, have kids who are still at home and uh, maybe <laughs> there for a long time, uh, given the, the cost of housing. So again, coming back to the living circumstances that people are struggling with right now, giving people more options and more choices. Uh, definitely, you have to be someone of means, not going to deny that mm -hmm. uh, for this opportunity, but uh, it will address segments of the market, segments of the need of, of the housing challenge that we have, and that comes back to the toolkit. We need as many ways of getting at this as possible. All right, mm -hmm. let's go back up to Sudbury. Angel, tell us what the benefits are to creating another building on a homeowner's lot where there already is a house. I think it's really just... Uh, especially when you're looking at neighborhoods, when you're looking at the housing crisis right now, affordability, if you're you're maximizing that lot with an additional dwelling unit on it, you're, so you're reducing costs overall and you're just intensifying that footprint so that there's more, you know, you're closer to things, you're, there's less of that urban sprawl, which we see a lot of up north. Uh, essentially, everybody wants a lot of land, and uh, it it's obviously gets cheaper the further out you go out of Sudbury. Uh, so for younger, uh, younger people that uh, are just coming out of school or just trying to get their careers in place, they want to get a home. Even for rental, it's, it's, it's quite high. So for them to be able to afford to pay rent in say a more affluent neighborhood somewhere that they'd really like to live the the rent would be quite intense whereas if you're if you have individuals that start kind of putting these lots these additional dwellings on their lots it's redu it's sort of a passive income for them and they could provide that reasonable rent for uh younger individuals with uh different income levels. Well, let me pick up on that with Tim. In your experience, do people who own homes want to be in a position of being 
sort of mom and pop real estate developer slash landlords? What I've seen is there's sort of two categories. Mm -hmm. There's the homeowner type, which I think is what you're describing, where the, you know they live in the principal residence and they rent out the second or the third unit. There's also the property owner type, which is they don't reside there, but they rent out the entire unit. So there's sort of two categories. In Kingston, primarily, the majority of the take-up has been on the property owners, so full rentals, as opposed to homeowners. But to some of the points that uh, the other panelists have made about for homeowners right now, where buying a home is perhaps getting a little bit far-reaching, this helps offset the mortgage mm -hmm. and the payments associated with that. And it also provides more rental units on the market. So which, people are game to do it. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Christine, um, I want to circle back to something you said earlier. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the moment, you, you, if you're putting a garden suite in your backyard or something like that, uh, you can't sever that and sell that, can you, to somebody else? You're just no. a tenant at that point. Not right? in Toronto. Not at the not moment. Not in Toronto. Right. No. Should not it be that way? I think it should. Um, I look at uh, London, England has Muse Housing, which was old carriage houses behind the main house that are all mainly independent properties now and very, very affluent neighborhoods sort of within the main neighborhoods. Um, so I, I think they should be severed, uh, ultimately, if that's what people desire. But I think we need to see those laneway houses or those laneways becoming their own kind of streets mm. in a way. And um, as Greg had mentioned, you know, cycling down the laneways, you start to see people living and occupying and um, making their mark on those spaces. We'll see that more and more, and it will become the next natural step. Any thought to that, Greg, allowing severance and purchase of those smaller suites on the edges of the property? Yeah, you know, first things first, we need rental housing in this city. Uh, more than anything else, we need uh, that flexible housing stock. We're not building enough rental housing for all kinds of other reasons. It would probably take another panel to cover. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the provincial direction is certainly accessory dwelling units on the same lot. Um, tethered to the main house for, for water and, and, and hydro. Um, and that's the principal opportunity here is I think to expand housing options through that means. Uh, there could be the odd, the odd one that you know, makes sense to sever, but the whole thrust of the, of the policy direction has been uh, rental housing and, and associating it with, with the, main, the main dwelling. Gotcha. Can you take us back to 1998? This was amalgamation year, I guess, right. for Kingston. What did you do in that city to kind of make all of this easier to have happen? Oh, well, um, I don't know if it exactly happened in 1998. Um, we actually just passed our consolidated zoning bylaw last year. You're it took, kidding. It took us 20 years. <laughs> wow. Why? Uh, it's just one of those projects that got pushed <laughs> off and off and didn't get done. <laughs> But I'm very thankful we have one zoning bylaw now, not five. So one zoning bylaw instead of five allowed yeah. you to happen, but it took 20 years for that one zoning bylaw to be approved. It did. That's an, another story onto itself, absolutely. <laughs> we're, 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 I, I, we've got lots of show ideas here for yeah. future shows, apparently. Uh, okay, do we have that problem when we went Mega City in Toronto in 1997? We, we uh, I would say, the, the ability to have this dates back to I think 2003, if, and I'm nodding at my planning, uh, my planning friend here, but uh, the city did not really get its act together until much more recently with with laneway suites. Uh, we've had we've had permission for secondary suites, you know, house a, a, a unit in the basement for quite a number of years, but we had certain tests associated with that. So I would say a lot of hesitancy about this, and something happened. And I think it was the housing crisis, the housing challenge, the mm -hmm. fact, frankly, that more people were feeling the affordability pinch than they had previously. Um, and, and not that a lot of people haven't been feeling that affordability pinch for a long, long time. They have. But old so habits die hard. Old habits die hard. And I think this evolution has picked up speed and people's values are changing, changing about it. The norms are changing about it. The, the way that people talk about housing today um, it, that, that wasn't in the conversation the way it was maybe 15 years ago, and it's probably next to parking, unfortunately, <laughs> the, the number one issue. Thing. Let, let's go back to Sudbury. Uh, Angel, how about in, in Sudbury? Do, what is the sense at City Hall as to whether or not uh, the city mothers and fathers have truly embraced these new and different ideas in terms of dealing with the housing crunch? 
think Sudbury is definitely uh, embracing some of these new ideas. I know even kind of the tiny homes concept is, is becoming a little bit of a popular um, idea throughout the um, city and in the uh in the zoning bylaws uh they're, they're looking how at how tiny is a tiny can, home incidentally uh i think roughly around 400 to 500 square feet that's tiny yeah <laughs> so and the idea the concept of that is really to uh there it's kind of this co-housing uh type of uh format where uh you may have kind of a commute the, the primary residence is sort of like has its communal um kitchen and laundry and stuff like that and then your tiny home is uh, really for kind of your sleeping uh you have a study area washroom uh, but it can get larger than that so uh some some interesting concepts would be to essentially you know could you could you have a tiny home that's on a larger uh lot and sever that lot and and you start integrating that into the uh neighborhood fabric and, and it's really just creating different housing types, different housing options, I think is really what's important here. And as many as, uh, as, every, uh, as you've all said on the panel, that it's not so much that laneway housing is the, is the ultimate solution. It's just sort of that one piece that can start kind of helping towards uh, providing more afford affordable housing or rental options. Right. Greg, I want to ask you about whether or not you feel, as the chief planner for the City of Toronto, whether you feel as if you have in some respects lost control of the housing file in as much as the province has really told all of the municipalities in Ontario, get going. And if you don't get going enough, we'll just bring in a ministerial zoning order forcing you to get going. Do you feel you've lost control of the file in some respects? You know, the, the housing file is um, a multifaceted file. Um, so people automatically look to government and say, get going. Um, province sets some goals, sets some standards, um, sets some policy. It's a policy-led system in Ontario. Municipalities act on that. Um, in the city of Toronto, we approve, uh, on average, in the last five years, 28,000 housing units. That's an, a considerable, when you compare it across North America, that's a considerable number of approvals. Yet, when you look down the other end of the pipeline, the completions are around 15,000 a year. Um, and that's not blaming anyone. That's just being upfront about the capacity of the system, of the entire system, to build housing. Not enough. Not Workers, enough not drywallers, enough materials, not right, enough okay. carpenters, uh, people coming through schools, supply chain, um, the cost, the interest rates, the carrying charges that developers face. It's a big, complex system, and all parts of that system have to be firing up and working well to produce uh, the amount of housing supply that we need. I'd also say, though, that we need attention more directly and a more direct government role on affordable housing. Because the market, by its very nature, will not build intrinsically affordable housing at the rent levels that we need in the city of Toronto and, and of course, across the province. And are they? Is this government doing that? This government is, is, I think, challenged to support the amount of affordable housing as well as the federal government is challenged to support the amount, amount of affordable housing that we need. When you think about the direct and indirect programmic support that uh, cities got back in the 60s and 70s around, uh, around uh, 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 interest rate relief and other programs that don't exist today, uh, HST uh, rebates, all kinds of things that are, I think, part of that toolkit that need to come to the fore. And at the end of the day, the taxpayer, one way or the other, may have to, may have to pony up a little bit more to make a societal uh, you know, to recognize that this is a societal issue, mm -hmm. this is a societal problem, and that we all have to solve it together. Let's look at some stuff. And by that, I mean your work, for oh. starters here. Shall we? Uh, we are going to look at what Design Magazine considers to be some of the best-looking laneway homes in Toronto. And, Christine, I think this is one of yours, right? Everybody here in the studio look at the monitor. Take us through this and tell us why you believe this to be a well-designed laneway house. Well, this was, uh, this was a, a laneway house for clients who are actually neighbours uh, of mine in, in the, the High Park neighbourhood. It's in West and, End, Toronto. Yeah, and they, they wanted this as a, a rental. They recognised that 
Um, they didn't really use their backyard as much as they expected. They have a cottage. They spend a lot of their summers in, you know, the kids are in sports or they're out camping or playing, you know, up at the cottage. And so they kind of thought, well, let's use our backyard um, for something more intensive. Okay, so just so I'm clear, yeah. and Sheldon, I'm going to want you to bring that picture up again. Black and white rectangular lines, cantilevered second floor, right. creating an overhang. I mean, that looks like a great house. Thank Where's you. the actual house? So the actual house is behind this one. The actual house is behind this what is we're looking at. This is a two-bedroom laneway house. Um, it's, you know, it's got really nice spaces. How many square feet? Um, I think about 1,100. Okay. It's south-facing, so it's beautiful light. And yeah. there's a little uh, garage that the main house uses as a woodworking studio. Okay. So we've got uh, a little bit of light industry and a little bit of residential mixed together. But this was a really, really lovely home to work with and the clients had a beautiful vision for, for what they wanted to see when they looked out the back of, of right. their house. What did it cost? It cost uh, probably, you know, closer to the three quarters of a million mark. Mm. Yeah. That's Toronto. Yeah, but that's Toronto. Yeah. And we had an amazing builder who just every detail was perfected. Okay, we got so. more. Let's, and if, I want some feedback from everybody on this stuff here. Let's bring up the second one. There's a, another a very modern looking home, straight lines, prominent garage, big windows, so lots of light. And this again is, I guess this is you know, a butted too. Boxy. They're boxy. Yeah, they, have, yeah, they are boxy. They are yeah. boxy. The zoning bylaws are very specific. Mm -hmm. So if you want to max out your square footage, which you need to do to make it affordable, you do end up with boxy designs. Okay. Yeah. Bring it up. Sheldon, bring it up again if you would. Angel? Okay. I want you to be hugely critical here of your colleagues' work. <laughs> what, what do you think of this? I think it's a it's a beautiful design. I mean it it definitely when, when you think of uh, a laneway house, this is sort of a, a great concept for, I, I mean, I would want to purchase this. I, I think it uh, it has a, a nice slick look to it that would really cater to a lot of your younger uh, generations that they just like simplicity um, and something that just looks modern and, and slick and that adds to the character of the neighborhood. Okay, let's, uh, Tim, I'm going to get you to do, and these are not Christine's, no. just the first Only one was. Only the first one, yeah, yeah. the first one was. Here's another one. Sheldon, let's bring up picture number three. Okay, here we go again. Uh, you know, rectangular shaped, white and beige, laneway house, sort of a central structure, windows facing the laneway and the side. Okay, Tim, your view on this. What do you think? Oh, uh, I, I think the design, I could probably work a little bit more, like the first two. You're a being bit so better. diplomatic. I am, yeah, I am. you are. You don't like this um, that much, do you? Well, beauty is in the eye of the <laughs> beholder. Now, now, one okay. thing I think that's interesting, we tend to talk about um, these laneway houses on an individual basis. We actually had a project in Kingston. It was a former school site that sold. And within that school site, we created 23 lots, and on the lots, in the front, two units, and on the back, garages, two spaces and above a, a detached unit. So in total, 69 units hmm. within a former school site. So as a project, so it's actually turned out very well. There were freehold and the laneways and such are, are condominium elements. So when I saw the first two photos, that's Im immediately what my mind went to was that was very similar to the design we were, we were looking at there. Right. Okay, I'm going to see if Greg is going to be a little less diplomatic about what he thinks about this one here. Greg, here's one, brown siding, long <laughs> rectangular windows. Uh, I guess it's sort of along the ground floor. Kind of looks like a, but the other ones are very boxy. This one is a barn shape. And again, really abutted to what looks like a garage of the house, and it's right on a laneway. Uh, okay, Greg, your thoughts on this? Somebody's home? It's fantastic. I think, uh, uh, you know, in, in we, were, we were saying the size of these things, like uh, if it's 1,100 square feet, that's the size of a large condo in Toronto. That's two or three bedroom condo in mm -hmm. Toronto. Grade related housing. They can walk to parks, they can uh, walk to the main street for shopping. They can um, probably get away with not owning a car, I would say, because mm -hmm. so many of these places are in approximation, or in approximation to uh, transit. But again, I'm going to infer from the way you describe this place that you don't love the look at it, the look of it, 
But you're right, it's somebody's home. You know what? I'm gonna leave design to the architects. We have a fabulous, <laughs> we have a fabulous uh, architecture guys, and designer guys, community in Toronto. And this <laughs> is just gonna make the, the juices flow, I think, for the incredible creative industry we have in Toronto. Okay, we got a few minutes left here. Let's do a few more pictures. Christine, I want you, if you were to talk about, now this is London, UK, these pictures we're gonna see here. Mm. So Sheldon, bring up the first one. This is pick five. What, it would, what do we call this? Like cobbles, is, um, cobble, yeah, cobblestone stones. square. Yeah, um, this would be an example of a yeah. muse, which mm -hmm. is which is sort of what what I imagine our laneways might look like. That looks nice. You know, eh? in seventy five years from now, right? When when the laneway house program is fully developed and basically operating as as its own city. But you those know? really look it's, like homes instead of boxes, right? Yeah. Do yeah. you like that? Do you like that better? Well, they were more original uh, buildings. London was just generally denser than Toronto is, so a lot of the muse mm -hmm. homes are converted carriage homes with um, servants' quarters on top. Huh. So they're, they're historic buildings that are being readapted. Okay, Sheldon, right. picture six, if we could. Okay, Angel, tell me what you, again, we've got uh, another muse look here. So there's two-story housing on either side, cars parked right along the street. Again, cobblestone uh, pavement. What do you think of this? I, I lived in Europe for a couple of years and uh, I've always loved uh, just the way the cities are kind of developed and formed. Um, it, to me, this just looks like a, a nice streetscape that is, is walkable and uh, has great character to it. So it, it's, it definitely has a nice feel. It does look homier, doesn't it? Okay, bring up yeah. uh, Sheldon, if you would, picture seven. And here's one more. Tim, describe this and tell us what you either like or don't like about it. Well, what, what I like about it, and again, I'm going to say this is likely a, a European example, and mm -hmm. I think in the European context, this is the type of housing scenario you see. I mean, everything is very walkable within their cities. Uh, they were designed originally for people to live in, not for cars, which is what most mm -hmm. North American cities are designed around. Um, and, you know, for us to shift to this sort of mindset, I think you're seeing it in the larger cities. You're certainly seeing it in Toronto. You're seeing it in the downtown parts of, of Kingston, the older parts of Kingston. But I think as a whole, it will be very difficult in North America to shift the mentality to this in the suburban areas. Let me get uh, Greg on that. Can we bring up picture seven again? And, you know, Greg, take a look at this. We're talking cobblestone streets. We're talking lots of windows, so presumably lots of light getting into these places. Two stories. They really look like homes as opposed to boxes. Can we do this in Toronto? Ironically, people get on a plane and they go to Europe to see this <laughs> and then they come back home and and, uh, and wonder why can't we have that here and of course we can have that here. I think that evolution, uh, well, m while it's um, may seem slow, we've got I think it's 19 mall sites across the city of Toronto that are going from a single use, let's go shopping experience to a live, work, play, uh, transit connected uh, experience where you can maybe have a home, maybe go and enjoy the public realm, much the way you see in that shot. Uh, and that's the evolution I think that's, that's underway in, in urban North America, and you're seeing that in the city of Toronto. Great. I want to thank all of you for coming uh, into our studio here at the middle of uh, the capital city and up north in uh, Sudbury, Ontario, Angel. Dimitruk, architect, partner at Third Line Studio. Tim Park, who's the director of city planning services for Kingston. Greg Lintern, chief planner for Toronto. And Christine Lawley, Solaris Architecture. Thank you. A Toronto firm specializing in laneway houses. Uh, you've made us all a lot smarter over the last half hour, so thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you for Thank having you. us. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.